The Last Word with Stan Collymore. Stan Collymore! Oh, yes. Telling it as it is. Instead of tweeting and putting on Instagram that Collymore's this and Collymore's that, go and tell us. No holes barred. Oh, Stan. Pure, unadulterated Collymore. And Stan Collymore strikes. Happy Monday to one and all and a very warm welcome to The Last Word with me, Stan Collymore, and my co-presenter today, Paddy Barkley, one of the great British football writers. Every Monday, my guests and I take a look back at the main talking points from the Premier League weekend. We bring you the biggest interviews with giants of the game like Gary Lineker, Gary Neville, Jurgen Klopp, Sol Campbell and Stylian Petrov. I had to move and it was, uh, it was important for me to move and develop in a different way. Finishing off with the news from around Planet Football. This is The Last Word with Stan Collymore. Come on! The Last Word with Stan Collymore. SeaTech has developed the latest technology in removing varnish and lacquer from wooden floors. It's called PeelTech. Don't burn it off, peel it off. PeelTech brings wooden floors up like new. PeelTech doesn't have methyl chloride in it, so no more stingy eyes or fingers. PeelTech is the best paint remover out there and completely safe to use. Saves hours of labour, so you can watch the footy and listen to me whilst doing your DIY jobs. With PeelTech and CT1. Two number ones. The last word. Paddy, absolutely delighted to uh, have you back in the oh, uh, in the be. co-presenters. Great uh, to be here. You, you had a little bit of a dodgy voice, but you're in full full lung burst. Yeah, in I, I'm, form. All, I'm all right now. I'd been uh, I'd been watching Dundee last time uh, last time we worked together on this uh, the, this podcast and. Uh, I uh, had a more modest uh, game on Saturday, Sheffield Wednesday against Fulham. Uh, it was less exciting. OK, well, let's get to some exciting Premier League action. Of course, Sheffield uh, Wednesday and Fulham in the Championship. I know yeah. Fulham's your local uh, team, is. back down it by is, the yeah. river, saunter down and oh, uh, watch the Cottages. I had a little bit of a spell there as a, as a loanee from Aston Villa back in uh, about 1998, three months on loan. Loved it, mm. uh, as Kevin Keegan uh, once <laughs> said. Uh, right, uh, the big game, Super Sunday, Paddy. Um, Crystal mm. Palace Wolves, West Ham Man United, Arsenal against Aston Villa, but the big game of the day, really it was at Stamford Bridge I was there I went into the post-match press conference and I spoke to both managers Jürgen Klopp and Frank Lampard Jürgen thoughts on the team performance today very good in moments in big moments uh, a lot of moments I would say in periods um, <clears throat> Chelsea had their moments of course because they are just good um, two wonderful goals a lot of brilliant pressing situations where we won the ball in the perfect space, but then we didn't use the the ball uh, that situation well enough. So we could have had much more chances in this situation. Um, after half time, two big chances could have been three and four, and but we didn't score, and so that was clear. The game was still open, and when um, when Kante scored his wonderful goal, then it was clear game on and um, let's go for it and uh, Chelsea did it, we had to defend it and um, that's a job to do. So it's a difficult place to go, to come, obviously it's a while ago that we won here, it's a while ago that anybody won here I think and um, so it's, it, it feels big to be honest, it's a, it's a big one today. Frank, do you think Chelsea are the better side of the 90 plus minutes today? Um, performance, yes, um, particularly the second half. Um, Within that, you have to say details lose your games. For me, no goal loses us that game because you can't have a free header in a six-yard box, um, and I, and it's hard to accept sort of congratulations after a loss. We can't be there, but we we must say that the way we played in the second half is towards where we want to be: energy, passion, moving the ball quickly, changing the play, getting crosses in the box, things that we work on, and we did it against Liverpool. and And it's not easy. I think a half time against two 0 down, you could actually probably lose. Well, I don't know. You can take it on the chin and go, this team's too good that we can't turn this around. We did the opposite, which I'm proud of. Um, but we need points too. I guess the question is, what did we learn? Um, we knew that Chelsea have a fine young side, Mason Mount, Tammy Abraham in very good form. We know Liverpool as champions of Europe are uh, focusing their attention this season on the Premier League. Yeah. Um, from my perspective, I thought that, that Liverpool were generally very good throughout the game without being spectacular. Mm. Um 
had a chat with Frank Lampard and Jurgen Klopp um, post-match. Jurgen was more pragmatic. Frank thought that they uh, were the better team. But in terms of uh, the Premier League weekend where Manchester City won 8-0 and got back on track, vitally important for the Red Men of Liverpool just to win the game. I think that. I, I, I think watching um, the almost sort of vindictive performance of Manchester City against Watford, I think it was part of their thinking that this is a chance to get this weekend is was a chance to get something back on Liverpool because they were away at Chelsea. Um, it wouldn't have ta- taken a genius to work out that's going to be one of Chelsea's tougher away, one of Liverpool's tougher away games this season, uh, and that's how, exactly how it turned out. Unfortunately for Pep Guardiola and his players, it didn't. It, Chelsea weren't quite good enough to. To, to take two points off Liverpool. Um, in terms of the, the, the tale of the game, I mean, uh, firstly, Liverpool soaked up Chelsea pressure. I've been to Stamford Bridge several times this season and, and Chelsea really do come out of the traps. Yeah, yeah fantastic sides. Yeah. And, and I love watching them. I mean, yeah, it's quite incredible that from this sort of Chelsea, the Roman Abramovich years of coming in, buying everything, buying the title, plastic flags, plastic fans, all yeah. of this kind of <laughs> yeah. stuff that was thrown at them. Um, I actually have a very big soft spot for Frank Lampard and yes. this Chelsea team. Yes. Um, we'll come to them very shortly. But in terms of the goals, what a free kick from Trent Alexander-Arnold, wow. um, growing into the one of the world's great fullbacks, along with, of course, Andy Robertson, your compatriot on yes. the other side. Well, I'm glad you said that, Stan, because I, I a lot of the... The popularity of Robertson tends, if anything, slightly to overshadow uh, Alexander Arnold. Yet already, you know, he's proved himself one of the best set piece footballers in the world. And I, th- I agree. I'm glad you said that one of the best fullbacks in the world. I honestly think he's a phenomenal player. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I go back an awful long way. I've seen great fullbacks all over the world. He has that. He's basically he's an infant world class player is how I would put it. I can't see unless something goes wrong with his development, he is going to become, as you say, um, you know, one of the one of the very best in the world. Now we've just watched the highlights um, just to jog both of our memory in terms of the the, the tail of events because it was a, an action laden game. Liverpool go two 0 up. And then I want your thoughts on every single week. We have a big story, and I was yeah. oh, it, it, it invariably works around VAR, and we're going to yeah. come to some of the big VAR issues shortly. VAR this week on the last word is Stan Collins because it's every week. Yeah. Um, but Chelsea had a, a goal, uh, Cesar Aspilicueta chalked off, mm. and it was chalked off because I think it was Mason Mount was yep. was uh, six inches offside yeah, yep. on the match of the day commentary. Um, I think they basically said if he had a size seven boot instead of a size six, yeah. or a size six instead of yeah, a size seven. Exactly. Vars, your fault. Mm. Well, Vars, not my fault. I will plead for guilty to the change in the offside law. I mean, if if we've got a tell ten, us this incredible I, story right, because okay. you rock up. This is true. again. This is why you're one of the great <laughs> the British uh, football well, journalists because you listen to. Tell I us was, going I, all the way I back about old, the daylight yeah, rule. Uh, this is this is the daylight rule. Now, I, in my opinion. FIFA, is, this was me one, FIFA nil, and uh, because they made a mistake. What happened was that I had a relationship with the the um, the Scottish FA. I Who got. are one of the, just to give our, our listeners mm. uh, an idea, the International Football Association which board, the which rules. makes the rules, is made up of uh, the FA, the Scottish FA, Northern Ireland and Wales, because yeah, of our historical, historical significance yep. in the yep. game. Yep. We have a vote each, four yeah. votes. Yeah. And FIFA has four votes. Correct. You have to have 75% of votes to pass a law change. Yeah. So FIFA can't do it without the home without nations. British. The home nations can't do it without FIFA. Yeah, exactly. That's that's the background. I knew the Scottish FA and before the international board, I, I was coming back from a Scotland game and I was talking to the chief executive, a guy called Ernie Walker. Still around, I think, Ernie. And... Um, I was telling him about that. I said, it drives me mad why they don't change level to onside. It would produce more goals. Because at that stage, we're talking level, about up until the early level 90s, was offside. level was offside. And you got, let's say, you, you got up to 20, 25 offside decisions in a game. Honestly, it was, it was terrible. And it was so easy to put right. Now, there have been other changes in the offside law since, all of which I think are terrific. But the, this... I think this was the key one, and the Scottish FA piloted it through FIFA. But the one thing they left out, out of the draft that I'd given Ernie Walker, 
um, was that you've got, if you're going to do this, you've got to have what is now called a daylight rule. So it's a clear in and other obvious, words, in other words. It's got to be clear. You've got to be, it, what I actually wrote in my draft was if any part of a player is level. In other words, the, the, it would be different if Mason Mount's little toe had been on, had, had been level, or or in, in, in or if there had been, if, or if his trailing heel had been level, then his toe wouldn't have mattered, and it would have been even more positive. We would have got even more goals than we have in all the, the things. But FIFA saw fit to edit my draft, and the rest is history. And never a week has gone by when I don't think, why the hell didn't they just leave it in? Right. So at the moment we've got a situation with VAR, and it's a big debate. So we yeah. may as well get into it is that I've shown you several clips whereby, let's say, an attacking midfielder, let's yep. say James Madison, for argument's sake, has yep. got a cracking goal this weekend. Oh, Again, yeah. we'll come to that. Mm, he picks so. the ball up. He's 30, 20 yards outside the 18-yard box. Everybody can visualise that in a central position. He's about to pull the trigger on a pass mm. through to Jamie Vardy. Yep. If that ball goes through... Jamie Vardy scores and there's a VAR check, but Jamie Vardy is clearly offside. No problem, Governor. Nope. He's been caught, bang to rights. Mm -hmm. In the current law, if his toe is a millimetre offside, he's offside. No problem. First mm -hmm. phase of play, to use a rugbyism. Yes. yes. But we are now seeing goals being brought back, particularly the Cesar Aspilicueta one, mm -hmm. eight, nine, ten, fifteen seconds after the original move started. In other words, they are rewinding, not three seconds yeah. to a central midfielder playing a pass through to Jamie Vardy. We're going all the way back. Yeah. Is that appropriate use of the rules and the laws in your opinion? Uh, no, I, I, I agree with, I mean, you put it in the form of a, of almost, um, you know, a question that answers itself because yes, it, the, you, you, the distinction you draw is absolutely right. Um, I personally still think that if Jamie Vardy is hovering on off the shoulder of the of the defender and he's a toenail ahead, I even think that should be allowed. Give the benefit to the striker. In other words, go back to Why? Because just... you have more chances, more goals, more entertainment for the fans. And besides, your strikers, I mean, your strikers get the jersey tugging, so that slows them down. They get that all the time and you never get that because referees, to be fair to them, can't see that. Sometimes you can't see even on a, a replay for VAR. So it's it's very very difficult. So and forwards have that to put up with as well. That's why I think you should give them basically daylight, um, anything but daylight uh, as an advantage. I don't see the. I, I I think that would be pro football, and it would definitely clear up the the the, the Mason Mount question that you've just drawn attention to. And Cesar as Pilaqueta would have got the goal he deserved. Um, uh, the question I wanted to ask in the press room yesterday is rammed. There were 300 uh, requests yesterday, pitch side in the uh, the, the finery of Chelsea's um, uh, press room, where you get fed very, very well as well. I yes. didn't eat anything, but I saw, Gosh, some I, of my, I, saw, I saw some of my comrades uh, yeah. on seconds and thirds in the salmon section in particular, uh, Paddy. Um, yes. I want to ask you one question. One about Liverpool. Are Liverpool the real deal and can they make a real title tilt on B? Um, one loss, I think, in the last 45 games. Mm. And Chelsea, the age-old question that Fergie was asked about, Neville, Scholes, Giggs. You can have... Chelsea win anything with kids this season? <laughs> I don't know if they can win anything. I'm, I, I don't know, League Cup, I don't know. Um, I don't think they're going to win a major trophy with that team. And it's, I don't think it's necessarily because of kids. After all, the three they've brought in are 21. They've got Tammy Abraham, for example. A fair amount of experience in the championship and, and successful experience. So, no, I, think, I, th I don't think it would be for that reason. I think probably because the money either isn't available or isn't being made available and they, they're banned anyway from, from spending big money. So I think for that, that, that would be my main reason that Frank isn't able to replenish the squad with a real, real top player um, that, uh, that he needs. But uh, to, Liverpool, to real deal. In, in, in effect himself. Liverpool, yes, will win the league. I'm absolutely convinced of that. Um, I think also if you, if you want a prediction... And I'm not so sure about this. I think they and Man City are going to swap trophies this year. 
Which, think, of course, I think that if you'd if you'd secretly would have asked either yeah. manager in the last two weeks of the of this of the European season last season, mm. they'd have taken yeah. either then because yeah. it's Manchester City's will that they have to win the Champions League with this, the the billion pounds that they've spent in this process, yeah. and Liverpool, of course will never be seen as a great uh, Liverpool team unless they win and, a 38-game domestic season. They know they have to win a, Exactly. The English Championship is, is, I mean, OK, so Europe's part of their history, but the English Championship certainly is, and that's what they would want. Uh, you know that better than it. You've been there. So, uh, yeah, but I, I also think that Man City have a very, very good chance, of the a far better chance than ever of the Champions League. You might say, how are they going to win the Champions League with no centre-halves? By the time of the knockout stages, they will have had a window, either a window or Laporte makes a better recovery than is feared. Of course, John Stone's out as well, so they have John a real defensive John Stone's is less, less vital, but yes. OK, let's go into the uh, weekend's action, starting with Friday night football on the South Coast. Southampton against Bournemouth, uh, the tail of the tape. Um, first win at Saints in 15 attempts for the Cherries. Callum Wilson involved in 27 goals this season, 18 scored, 9 assists. Only Raheem Sterling uh, more since the start of last season. Um, Harry Wilson on loan from Liverpool has chipped in massively. Yes. I love Philip Billing that they've brought, who's a real ratting uh, and a physical presence in midfield along. Yep. Alongside Lerma, um, Josh King, I think he's stepping up and being a reliable forward outlet for for Bournemouth. The only real criticism Paddy going into this season mm. was that they scored a lot of goals but conceding a lot of goals. Yeah. Now with the added beef that they've got, they're yeah. still scoring goals but conceding less. Conceding less, yeah. I, I must say it, they're very, very impressed. We keep waiting for the Bournemouth bubble to burst in a sense, but... Uh, Anything, anything but that on the evidence of what we've seen this season. I'm, I'm, I'm a fan, as you, you point out, the two Wilsons, uh, uh, definitely. Um, but what, what we make you are of- also very. I, I also liked you, you talking about King because for me he's a very, even if he's not playing, he's an important member of the squad. He's, he's, he's been a real strength to the club. What are we making of um, Eddie Howe in terms of his progressing of oh, management? Because well. we t- two or three years ago, mm. when it was rumoured Arsene Wenger was leaving, that would Eddie Howe be sort of yeah, that of kind of pragmatic forward thinking? Um, could he take Bournemouth onto the next level? Dare I suggest that would be the best of the rest in a group? I mean, you look at that group at the minute. Mm. Leicester are playing very well and getting results, yes. but Watford aren't getting... We, we may well have expected Watford to be the best of the rest this season. Yeah. They've had a horrific start. Yeah. Um, West Ham United have started particularly well. Mm. Uh, Wolverhampton Wonders, who we'll come to, have had a difficult time of it, still haven't won a game this season. Could a Bournemouth uh, be around the 7th, 8th... Everton have had an uh, inconsistent start to the season, of course. Could Bournemouth and Eddie Howe get amongst that group? Yeah, it's a good show. Um, and if they did, would bigger clubs be looking at him? Yeah, well, yes and yes, definitely. I definitely think, I agree with you. I think there is a um, a sort of top six uh, vacancy. I mean, Manchester United would say, come on, you know, don't be silly. We'll definitely finish in the top six, but or the top five. But no, I, I think there's a, there is a vacancy in the top six left by Everton. And I'm sure we'll talk about, or you, you will yes. talk about Everton. Um, I, I would have bet anything on them being up in the certainly sixth or seventh, um, and lost now at home against Sheffield United. Lost at Villa Park uh, 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 as well. When Villa uh, uh, rooted, if not rooted towards the bottom of the table, they've struggled. So, well, those what are, does that say? say about those Everton? are the man. Ma- those are the matches that you're winning if you're going to break into the top six, uh, and certainly not losing. Um, yeah, so that's true. So to go back to your question about Eddie Howe, why on earth not? What he can't do, uh, what he and Bournemouth can't do together is sustain it. They could have a crazy season, get into Europe, but we all know what getting into the Europa League does to a club. Paddy, um, if we are quite excited about Bournemouth potentially this season, um, mm. first win at Southampton, as I mentioned, in 15, lots of goals in uh, front positions, addressing the defensive frailties. What about Southampton going forward? Charlie Austin and Ralph Hasenhall had a big spat before Charlie went off to West Brom in uh, pre-season. They brought in Che Adams essentially as his replacement from yeah. the Championship, Birmingham City. Can't buy a goal at the moment. We're into match day six, hasn't scored yet. Southampton fans getting a little bit prickly. 
Burnley. Mm. Goals win games. Yeah. Uh, is this something that Ralph Hasenhut will ask to find a solution to Definitely. very, very quickly? Otherwise, they'll lose the likes of Nathan Redmond, uh, James Ward-Prowse, as they lost Virgil van Dijk, Adam Lallana in years gone by. Yeah, I mean, it, it, in a way, it's, it's lucky that we've got a winter window coming up. Uh, rather than a summer one, because more business get, tends to get done. Will it be on but the basis of loans and stuff? Because you're not looking it, to it, add um, your core players in yeah. January. It's just going to be maybe but bringing It's going to need through. all of those names, really, that, that, that you mentioned. Now, either Jay Adams starts scoring, because, I mean, Southampton, to stay up, will need a 11 to 12 goal striker. There's no, no question about that. So, you know, either Jay Adams settles in, or that window is going to have to be used for buying, not loaning. One to watch for Southampton. Leicester against Tottenham Hotspur. Cracking game in prospect. Game. It, uh, it delivered. Leicester 2, Spurs 1. Um, how are we feeling about Spurs? No win in nine away now for Spurs. Two mm. points from the last 27 away mm. uh, for the Lily Whites. Um Little bit of cause concern. If if the high water mark was the Champions League final, I remember as well listening to uh, Maurizio Pochettino's post match press conference, mm. pre match press conference before the Champions League final against Liverpool, and yep. talking about it's a miracle where we are. And then as the season started, he moaned a little bit about he's the coach, he's not the manager, and he's not in charge of the purse strings. Mm. This is a guy that you should be, if you're Daniel Levy, mm. throwing money at mm -hmm. because they've performed a miracle with basically spending nothing on two transfer windows. And I just wonder now if the, ch the Champions League high watermark is now ebbing away very fast well, to the Tottenham Hotspur. The, the point is you are playing at very, very, uh, at very, for very, very high stakes. Everybody knows that one of his top players last season, uh, well, and for several seasons, Christian Eriksen, wants to go. Um, how do you replace him? Well, you replace him with James Madison. But are Leicester, with their ambitions, going to let Spurs have James Madison? I mean, it, it, we are talking about a, a, you know, a group of, of uh, the, the most coveted players in Europe, you know, uh, young players. And and it's 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 very difficult to say you know you're you're not playing monopoly and it, it's very very difficult to get the right people to improve a team. I guess the question is for Maurizio Pochettino is that is that when he's looking around and he's competing with Jurgen Klopp that can spend seventy five million on a defender. Yes. When he's he working can. against in the in the rarefied air against Pep Guardiola that his back four didn't work two years ago so he can demolish it and bring a new one in mm. is essentially saying give me something Daniel that I can build from. Well, are, are we concerned that at the end of the it's season? Good timing they've refinanced so there should be more money than is normal for a club that has just built a new stadium so I mean from Spurs point of view let's hope hope that is true but I, there's just one other thing I would I would like to say there are away defeats and away defeats and that wasn't a bad one really could have gone 2-0 up I, I want your thoughts again on oh the yeah, we'll uh, talk again about I, I showed you the 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 var yes. it, and again I counted eight seconds mm. Uh, between uh, Serge Aurier with the strike that scored. Yes. And if you rewind that all the way back, it was eight seconds to the beginning of the move where, uh, I'm not sure it was for Spurs, that was given offside. But an offside event essentially was given. I think it might have been Jung Min Son. Yes, it was. But, uh, but at 2-0, awesome. it's an unassailable lead, you would mm. imagine, for Spurs that are used to seeing games out. Absolutely. That goal not given, 1-1. One, one, and to be, to be fair to Leicester City, they came back and went through the gears. And in James Madison, yes. they have a real, a real potential gem. Yeah. gem there. Absolutely. As a super player, Madison, I mean, I've... Someone played for Aberdeen a few years ago. I played for Norwich, of course, and he's got getting better and better and better. Um, and Brendan Rodgers has got something good, really good going at, at Leicester. Let's just have a look at the midfield terrific. in particular. Because I picked I this out, this. Paddy. Yeah. Yuri Tielemans, the Belgian. Yeah. That proves that Leicester are a destination club, not just passing through. We yes. had his, yeah, they exactly. had the try before you buy with him, and he decided he wanted to stay. James Madison uh, in the last England squad undoubtedly now will be will a be, fixture if he continues we'll his consistency. Play. Before the end of this Harvey season. Barnes, another young Englishman, comes into the team. Ayozi Perez, they're signing. They're one of their one of their big well big summer signings.
training. Mm. Hasn't quite settled in and been brilliant yet, but again, yeah. um, very, very good in terms of his creativity. And uh, Wilfred and Didi that had a goal uh, chalked off very early on for offside. Those are five really good creative options behind Jamie Vardy. And a nice mix, yeah. Uh, that still, Jamie Vardy, has the hunger, the desire, the passion, because of being a late starter, to want to score goals and create problems. D- do we see yeah. Leicester at the moment, if we've talked about Watford, not quite starting the season very well? West Ham have potential. Everton's oh, yeah. um, inconsistency. Uh, Wolves having Europe. Are Leicester at the moment the one that you would... Um, if you're a betting man, put a pound on and say they yes. are the most likely to break yeah, into the top six. Exactly. If we were to talk about West Ham in that, you know, a Leicester fan would be fully entitled to say, hang on a minute, how can you put them above us? We were the champions a couple of years ago. And, and that sort of is in the club's DNA now. Um, so they don't want to become a yo-yo club again as they were, you know, I don't know, 10 years ago, something like that. So they... Definitely, Leicester have got the... And, of course, watching that game, there's there's also the relationship with the crowd. The crowd's ambition's grown, you know? when that, Which, of course, has come from the late chairman. He yes. came in and he gave lots of... You know, they'd have and, a beer and a pint and abs- wanting to engage absolutely. the audience, God forbid. And if you can, if you can build that relationship with... With the club and the and the and the and the community as they have done there, it's you know if you look at Liverpool's success, the crowd is a is a part of that. I know it sounds like a truism, but it's 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 a wonderful thing Leicester have got, and uh, in a way that you kind of want them to keep progressing, to keep that together. Um, a great sporting county as well. I know oh, uh, yeah. uh, cricket, of course. David yep. Gerald, Gary Lineker, who we spoke to yep. uh, last week, and rugby down on Welford Road. Uh, Burnley two, Norwich City nil. Fascinating clash of styles, dare I say, uh, Paddy, with this yep. one because uh, Burnley we see as the arch pragmatists. They play with two, sometimes three big front men. You think in Chris Wood yep. and Ashley Barnes. They've got a manager that uh, is very much pragmatic in Sean Dyche, who I, I like a lot. And then on the flip side, you've got the new boys, Norwich City, that play, play, pass the ball through the lines. Uh, Todd Cantwell, the new, another young English kid on the block, playing mm. behind Timo Pukki. But is this a real view yeah. into how one team has been in the Premier League for several years and has identified it must be a little bit pragmatic compared to one which is going to give great moments. Beat Manchester City, incredible at Carrow Road. Performance of the Norwich season. City, Norwich City fans are getting justifiably excited. Yeah. Arguably, yeah. It, w- it would have been a better result going to Bolton, uh, to Burnley and winning 2-0 and losing against where Manchester it, City at a, home. Where, to be honest, it's a six-pointer. Which, which the so, so does that isn't. does that sh- does that sh- show the, the the difference between the mentality of being in the Premier League for yes. several seasons and going in with lofty ideals? It does if you've got the same manager. In other words, if that knowledge resides in the club, Sean Dyche, uh, he took them up, he he, he took them down honourably, um, uh, they were never disgraced, and brought them back stronger and more confident. I think because they've been through it all. Uh, and and because it, it's, it's all they didn't because they didn't sack the manager because they got relegated like stupid clubs do. They, they but Burnley are a much more sensible club. They're just getting what they deserve, and they're getting. If you if you're lucky enough to get a good manager, you just make sure you keep him. I guess and, the question I'm asking, Paddy, yes. Norwich have conceded 14 goals now in six games. Mm. Um, Wonderful in the the early days of of you know late summer and and autumn when the pitches are great and your players are fit and you've got mm. a big pool to work from. Mm. Norwich City were conceding a lot of goals in the Championship. Yeah. Now those big games against Manchester City are yeah. going to come and you're going to yeah. uh, fantastic. Yes, but it is going to be Burnley away where you Look, stay in this Premier League, isn't I, it? I I, I I feared for Norwich after watching them in in the Championship. I know exactly what you're saying. Too pure. Too idealistic, the footballer. 99 goals, Paddy scored. Yeah. We've got Timo Pukki. We've, we've just beaten Manchester City. How dare you but, say that, but, that our philosophy doesn't work? if you're work. playing with great respect to Nottingham Forest and, 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 and so on, when you're playing a, a championship team, they don't punish you every time. Uh, and 
what what you get in in the Premier League is is you get punished. You, if you if you're a little bit naive or a little bit over. Now I have to say this this theory of mine. While I watched them play one twos to get out of their own box against Manchester City and win. I thought to myself, well, that's a theory that's gone down in flames. But I think you're right, really. I think over that long season, um, when, as you say, the, the fitness level's not as high, your squad gets stretched, I, I think I'm going back to fearing a little bit. Let's see. A fantastic week last week for Norwich City, of course, against the champions of England, Manchester City. Not so good this week. Delia? Love a bit of Delia yeah. on the uh, show. Every time that Norwich play, good or bad, Delia, we, we roll that clip out. I think she'd had a libation or two uh, on the pitch on uh, that day where she uh, gave the rallying call to the Carrow Road faithful for their support. Three more games on Saturday. Let's rattle through them, please, Paddy. Uh, on the last word with Stan Collymore. Everton against Sheffield United, tail of the tape. Mm. Everton conceded 20 goals versus, via set pieces under Marco Silva. Uh, conceded seven in the first three. Uh, Sheffield United unbeaten at the last 12 all games, of course, that takes in some of the championship. Uh, and Toffees have conceded two plus yeah. in the last five games. Yeah. If we're talking about the best of the rest, and they start the season very well, lots of people, again, stats can tell you uh, little bits, but not show the whole story. They're, they start to their season, and the end of last season at home at Goodison yeah. was becoming a fortress. They were keeping yeah. clean sheets, they were winning games. Richarlson looks as if he can be a massive threat for them uh, going forward. So just have a little look at the lineups. I mean, the midfield, Richarlson, Delph, Sigurdsson, Schneidlin, and Bernard, the big signing, fantastic balance and blend. Moise Keane um, uh, up front, yeah, of course. Yeah, huge reputation. Um, uh, comes uh, young, but uh, very much uh, mouldable. Think like Tammy Abraham, that kind of age, uh, that kind of, kind of inexperience, but also that kind of potential. Um, but I guess... If we say in the midfield, that's creativity in uh, Sigurdsson and in Bernard. It has legs and mm -hmm. graftability in mm -hmm. Fabian Delph and Schneiderlin. And it has Richarlson that can play any number of front positions and weigh in with goals. Mm. Are we saying the back four is as good? Seamus Coleman, mm. old warrior. Michael Keane, mm. young. Mm. We played for England last couple of years. Lucas Digne, left back. And Yerry Mina. Mm. Um, I think the left back's Terrific. Yes, Lucas Dina. Um, in terms of Everton this season, what, what, where should they be aiming? We, of course, we, you talked a little bit earlier about well, I, uh, the I, David Moyes team, which was Everton at, fifth, Everton aiming sixth, at Europe, Everton uh, aiming yeah. at Europe. But with those kind of statistics, Paddy, mm. conceded two plus in their last five games mm. against teams that I will bet my last dollar on in mm. Sheffield United and Aston Villa are probably not going to be free scoring this season. Yep. That has to be a little bit of a concern for Everton. It definitely is. And, uh, I, I mean, Sheffield United, um, Chris Wilder admitted after the game that it wasn't one of the great performances. It didn't have to be. Um, to, to be a rather toothless, a surprisingly toothless Everton. So... What can we pin this down to, though? Because there's undoubted talent there. Is this... Uh, I mean, I wrote in my Mirror column last week about mm. um, Everton yeah. is one of the grand damn English Ab clubs. Absolutely. And yeah. there's an expectation. It, look, the last one a trophy, 94-95, Duncan Ferguson, the Dogs of War. Mm. Um, do current Grim, Everton players, Grim, when they walk into the city and also... Which is England's most successful football city. If yes. You had up all the yeah. trophies yeah. between the yeah. two teams. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas Liverpool players walk through the door at Anfield and, and they can see the history, is it translating that Everton players, new signings, players that walk in, realise that there's an expectation week in and week out when you mm. play for Everton yeah. um, that doesn't seem to uh, uh, tally with their their inconsistency at the moment? In other words, yeah. are Everton players grasping the nettle that this is a club that is trying everything to push to be in those European places? Well, I thought I thought that the not only the, the signings, I mean, they've got. There's more money available at the club now. Now, now that Moshiri is there, and uh, so the the and the signings reflect that. Then you bring in Marco Silva, who's a manager that everybody knows about. And Do you rate him? I mean, I've, I've, he's done I all right at a, a, at a number of places, but not been spectacular no, anywhere, never, really. Never, well, he, since in his English career, he's not been around. That's what I mean. I mean, I know to, he's, to build, but that's partly because he's been coveted by other clubs and he's kind of 
accepted that flirtation. But Everton, you would have thought, is the place where you park yourself and you say, you know, maybe new stadium somewhere down the yes, road. Yes, on the dock. On the dock. Um, something. And I mean, people talk about how lovely Goodison is, but it's old. It's tatty. And you need something bigger for the modern, for them to compete with. with I mean, everybody else has got modern grounds. So um, I thought Marco Silva's signing as manager was the most was probably, with due respect to Gilfie Sigurdsson, and was probably the most impressive of all. Um, and it, I, I'm really astonished that it hasn't worked out. Having seen the, you know, the replay of the game, of the recording of the game on Saturday, you can completely understand why. They're uninspired. And, I, 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 you know, you mentioned Seamus Coleman before. He's been, if, if a right-back can be the engine of a team, he's been the engine of that club. For, for years, but um, he broke his leg, I think, 18 months ago, and he doesn't seem to have quite the same... He's still got the same commitment and the same knowledge, but whether he's got the same drive and pace that he used to have is doesn't look it to me. Time for others to step up for the Toffees. They lose uh, against Sheffield United. Two goals nil at Goodison, and having lost against uh, Aston Villa, of course, a couple of weeks before, three nil at Villa Park. That should worry uh, the Everton faithful. The champions of England, Paddy. Manchester City against Watford. Um, I mm. stuck the game on, and yeah. 20 minutes later... Um, I'm embarrassed for Watford. Mm. Uh, they lost, of course, in the cup final 6-0, which can happen against... Uh, yeah. Manchester City can I mean, six, rattle goals in against any team. Not a disgrace. Um, um, but eight go uh, one goal in the first minute and the manner in which Watford defended, no bottle, no leaders. I saw an interview with Ben Foster after mm. the game. I don't know if it was his match of the day interview. He was angry. And he kind of... La well, he, he wasn't. He laughed. He kind yeah, of oh, basi he did, yeah, he yeah, basically I said... You know, five nil after twenty minutes. I'm wondering if it's going to be a cricket score, but he's got a smile on his face and it's a bit laughing. It's a bit jokey. Yeah. He's one of your senior players. I would be a little bit concerned if I'm Kike Sanchez Flores because a Troy Deeney is out, and we've talked about and extolled the virtues of him as a leader. Mm. He's not available for selection for the uh, the Hornets at the moment. Mm. Um, but I'm I'm struggling to see where the, the leaders are. There's no doubt on any given day they have plenty of talent. Mm. That was proven last season by getting to an FA Cup final exactly, yeah. and only missing out on a top ten finish by losing against West Ham the last game. Um, midfield: Decore, Hughes, Capu, Fulkier, Fulkier. All very good technical players, but I didn't see anybody that was. Uh, wanting to light the blue touch paper no, that no. was aggressively shouting and dragging people into position. No, Watford I... started the season with a, a big billing. They haven't won a game yet. They've just been beaten eight 0 by the champions. And they're on the same. They're they're, they're, they're struggling. Match. Yeah, I mean, yes, they they are they are struggling terribly. They look, I mean, serious candidates for the drop. And certainly on Saturday. Now, yes, of course, playing Manchester City will magnify your deficiencies. But you can work. You can run. You can concentrate and none of those things were happening in the in the first half I mean the first goal the uh, the Bruno's pass I mean that there's fantastic nothing, right footed cross to the right you, of nothing you can do about that because it went it tempted the keeper and then curled back out again but surely you take you, you you go one nil down Paddy after after 60 well, that seconds should be your wake up all call. of you that's you, your wake up you've call. literally got the manager on the side rit ripping up his kind of yeah. his words and then it just becomes about Self-preservation, professional pride, yes. and Watford showed zero of that. And you're talking about what Ben Foster said about a cricket score. The only reason it was a cricket score is that Sid, the only thing you could criticise about City's performance was the finishing, particularly Aguero, of all people. Uh, I mean, you'd respect him to have dipped his bread, at, at least to the degree of a hat-trick. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it would definitely be in double figures if City's fi uh, finishing had been just par for the course. So, yes, it was a, it was a dismal display. And, 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 you know, when you see teams play, play like that, you sort of think, well, if you want to go down, go down. You know? The, the pre there's enough teams that want to come up into the Premier League. Bit of a worry for Kike Sanchez-Flores, a new well, manager, with, the, with a, the, the manner of the it, defeat. Well, it wasn't a bounce, it was a flop, you know? Um, Manchester City won in, um, it was Kharkiv, actually, because obviously the, the issues and problems in uh, in the Donbass region against Shakhtar Donetsk, a notoriously difficult place to go and mm. win. They won. 
they win comprehensively. Um, this should put a, a, a poke in the eye, dare I suggest, for those that were saying, um, you know, Otamendi struggling, no Laporte, John Stones is now out. They can still give teams a good hiding, even with a, a makeshift back Well, four. Guardiola has this technique. If he loses a centre-half, he puts a midfielder at centre-half. I mean, if you if you look uh, over his history, Bayern and Barcelona, that's what he did. He, he had midfield players that played centre half, and of course they could be incredible. Mascherano, you know, people forget he's a midfield player. Um, to have to have a Martinez, you know, and uh, it, when you think about it, it should be a blindingly simple solution. A lot of people would say that John Stones is a midfield player anyway, so it's it, it, it's just brilliant to see them do that. But they there again. Stan, you know, I might have been able to play centre half for Man City. On I think we both fancy it with, 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 with <laughs> watching the likes of Kevin De Bruyne and uh, Sterling and you, you the Silvers. You don't see too much action. They just do. seem to have twenty attacking players on the pitch at every time. Uh, final game on Saturday before we go to Sunday's game, Super Sunday, of course. We've already talked about uh, Chelsea against Liverpool, so we've got Crystal Palace Wolves coming up, uh, West Ham, Man United, Arsenal against Aston Villa. But first, uh, the late game on Saturday, Newcastle United against Brighton. Shouldn't have expected too much of this one. Paddy, no. quite simply because um, it finished nil nil, uh, yeah. uh, it, which is obviously um, it would suggest not the greatest of games. Yeah. But there were only four goals in uh, between both teams in the last four games, yes. um, and you could probably see why. Um, no home win yet for Newcastle United. So Steve Bruce, who errs more on the side of pragmatism than most managers when it's uh, looking to get a mm. result. Mm. Brighton struggle to score goals, full stop, and they've got a manager that's trying to change. But at least they're the trying style to now, yeah. uh, from Chris Hewton again, more mm. of a pragmatist than Graham Potter likes to get the ball down and play. But the the, the the story really was 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 of two things. One, the introduction of Andy Carroll, the the homecoming lad, which obviously the, you know that uh, he, he's, he's been around the block now. Um, surely they can't expect too much of him because he's. Injury prone. Yeah. Um, the, the, the contract, I think, stipulates that he has to play a certain amount of games to be able to get paid the kind of money that he undoubtedly has been on at West Ham United and Liverpool. So can he be a saviour? And secondly, empty seats at St. James's Park for the first time that I can remember in fairly significant numbers. It's maybe a trickle rather than a flood mm. at the moment. But Newcastle United fans have grasped the sort of militancy of s- some football groups around the world and said... No more with Mike Ashley. Yes. Something has to change. And if he won't well, change, right. then we will change him. Your thoughts, please. Yes, well, I, I, I'm certainly back there. I, 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 I think that Newcastle, the criticism I make of Newcastle fans, is they'd be, you know, where have they been, you know, for the last few years when the, the problem has been there? But I, I do take my hat off to the people who are, um, you know, um, demonstrating how they feel now. Um, I, and I feel sorry for, for Newcastle as a club. That can said, they drive out Mike Ashley? I mean, no, a lot of people would no, say they, you he, can't he, drive an he, owner out because they're no. so wealthy. They go when they want he, to go. I mean, in Mike Ashley's view, he is the club, and he's got a contract that you know. A, 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 I am on, the owner of the. I club. am the owner of Manchester United, signed by Mike Ashley and Newcastle witnessed. United. He wishes he was owner of, of Manchester <laughs> United. <laughs> Uh, Although I, I, stranger that's, things have happened, that's only his wildest dreams. Yes, yeah, Manchester United have had a few dodgy owners in the past, but do you remember I, what's his name? Juggling, Michael Knighton. Michael Knighton. I was, I saw his debut. Juggling. I can remember. I, I, I saw his debut. That was about eighty three, eighty four. I can't remember. And he was juggling year. on the pitch and all that. Yeah, I was like, that was Man the, United were playing Arsenal, and they so inspired by Michael Knighton's pre match display where he juggled the ball from the halfway line and blasted it into the empty Stretford end. That was a, a taster of what was to come with yeah, the Premier League. Of course, uh, way before the Premier League started. But let's That's go back true. to Newcastle. Yep. Um, you see, so you've mentioned about uh, Mike Ashley. Can these protests win or not? I don't think so. I think he's known that there's opposition. I think Mike Ashley will sell. I know exactly when Mike Ashley will sell Newcastle when he feels like it. That's the answer. And I'm, you know, it's awful. It's really sad. And we, you know, we've talked before on this podcast we've talked about clubs that are nice that, that are wonderfully run where the where the the crowd love the team and the crowd love the manager we you know we've talked about burnley we've talked about bournemouth newcastle's at the other end of the scale i mean the, there is nothing but antipathy between the ownership and the and the team i'm afraid are now i, I mean i think if anybody at least brighton were trying to win the game 
Um, I think Steve Bruce is in big, big trouble. We'll see. Uh, he's it's been mixed at the moment. So, uh, I think they were very poor at Norwich, and then oh, they've the had good. So uh, far, yeah, have, been, have, have been not too bad. No. So, I think that the jury's out with Steve Bruce at the moment. I a good not first half performance against Liverpool. They yes. take the lead, yes. so he will look to that and say there's stuff to build from. That concludes the Saturday, the Friday and Saturday uh, Premier League uh, review with uh, Paddy Barkley and I. You're listening to the world's number one football podcast. Podcast. 14 countries we've been number one so far. Uh, every Monday looking at the weekend Premier League games uh, and big stories with the biggest names in the game joining me for a taster on a Monday. The 10-15 minute interview, the the fantastic words of the likes of Gary Neville and Sol Campbell, Ian Wright to come, Gary Lineker to come. Uh, then the full interviews drop in every Friday in beautiful HD on YouTube and uh, a special bonus podcast every Every Friday. The last word with Stan Collymore. Before we look at the Sunday's games, I want you to sit back and relax and listen to a man that played for Celtic, played for Aston Villa, uh, Bulgaria's record caps holder, and played in the Premier League whilst having leukemia. This is a fantastic sit down and chat. Enjoy. Still in petrol. The last word with Stan Collimore. CT1 is the number one sealant and adhesive in the UK. Their research and development department are always looking to make those trade and DIY jobs that little bit easier for you. As you may know, popular brands of paint removal were banned due to environmental issues. CT1 have come with the answer. It's called Peel Tech. In the past, paint strippers were quite aggressive. If you use them, you'd know they'd burn your skin, sting your eyes even. The CT1 guys have developed an amazing solution to this problem. It doesn't burn, it doesn't sting, it just peels, peels the paint away. Bannisters are a big problem with all of those nooks and crannies. Not anymore with Peel Tech. Just spray it on and brush it off. Gone. Years of old paint removed. Garden gates and furniture can be a nightmare to strip back. It can take hours of labour as well. Peel Tech does it in minutes. Now you're free to watch the footy again. Stan Collymore. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by a man that is uh, uh, twice a hero for me. Because once uh, Aston Villa, uh, all of my heroes are villains. Uh, having been a, a Villa supporter since a kid and lucky enough to play for the club. But also Celtic. The last 10, 15 years have been fascinated with everything Celtic. Um... For many different reasons. So I'm delighted, Stillian Petrov, you've, you've joined us um, today on The Last Word with Stan Collymore. Um, I want to get an idea for our listeners, because they automatically see now so many players coming into the Premier League or into the Scottish Premier League or, or other parts of the UK. And they see players, whether it be from Eastern Europe, from Latin America, Western Europe, settle in, go and play, it must be easy. But of course, it's not quite that easy. You, you, you have a situation whereby you come from a, a completely different culture and a different footballing culture. Um, you have to learn a language, you have to get schools, you have to, for your kids, you have to settle in. When you moved to Celtic, one of the world's biggest football clubs, um, you didn't speak English. So how difficult was it in the first phase for you to settle into Glasgow? Well, first of all, it was uh, to make the decision to make that step, you know, to go to a different country. And don't forget, I was only 19 years old. Um, I was living on my own since I was 16. I moved to CSK Sofia. But moving in Bulgaria was easy. You speak the language, you know, the, 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 the people, you know, the nature, you know, everything. Everything is familiar. But moving to a different country is completely different. And for me... I had it easy. I decided maybe sometime I say I'm, I'm, I was too naive. I didn't think what was the con- consequences and what, what, what to expect really. The problem with that th- this year's in Bulgaria was about, about our idols. And we had the great idols in, in Bulgaria. It was Stoichkov, mm. Malakov. The night, if you remember the 94, you know. Absolutely we fantastic for, team. Great, yeah. yeah um, and I wanted to be like one of them. And uh, I was given the opportunity to move to a club like Celtic. Did you feel that you had to move abroad? Because CSK and Sophie is a, you know, it's a big club. It's a, it's a club known around Europe. Did you think 19 years of age, I could stay until 21, 22 and move? Or did you feel you needed to move at that stage? I had to move. I had to move. And it was, uh, it was important for me to move and develop in a different way. Because in Bulgaria, um, everybody, everybody was 
talking about me, that I've got the talent, I can make it, that it's something special. It was me and Martin Petrov at, uh, at mm-hmm. that time were coming through together. Uh, Martin already left uh, to play in Servette uh, mm-hmm. in Switzerland. So the offer came for me and I went, that's me. I had to go. Did you know uh, anything about Glasgow at that point? Uh, not much. I knew about Celtic. Uh, I didn't know much about uh, Glasgow. Uh, but it was some experience. You know, people talk about, you know, footballers, both of us, we went through it. We've seen the good life. We've seen the bad life. We've seen money. We've seen, uh, we've been dealing without money. Yeah. I had to leave and I didn't have a penny in my pocket. I had to leave because I loved football. I wanted to develop as a player and as a person. And for me, it was the perfect opportunity. My first experience was my agent and the deal, perfect. Um, he said to me, we have an issue with the visa. You have to just train on your own, wait for it. I met with him only twice. He obviously kept me about you know, how everything's going, is the visa is going to happen or not. Is that Over quite certain, stressful? Because it was, it was obviously stressful. now we know, we, again, we automatically see players come in, but you don't realise that particularly outside of the European Union, you have to have a, 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 a work visa and you have to have so many caps as an international, etc., etc. So you were training on your own? Uh, on my own. Um, I was nervous about it because I've signed the contract. Uh, I couldn't get paid because actually I don't have the visa. That was the agreement. He came a month later, no visa. Two months later, no visa. Three months later, a young boy, uh, nervous to go to the different country, a new club. Visa is not happening. I don't know what's happening. And all of a sudden, visa is done, you have to go. So I was sent on the plane, on my own, to go through Brussels. I got lost in Brussels. <laughs> I had to catch another flight. Had you been abroad much at that stage? Uh, yes, but as footballers, we look, we get looked after. Yes. You know. Turn up here, 10 yes. o'clock, we start at 10.30, finish at 12, uh, meet here at such and such, be on the bus for... The same as the travelling as well. Yeah. Be at 8, eight, eight o'clock at the airport, drop your back and a check-in, you already give your passport to the player liaison, he checked you in, you go through this uh, gate, that's where the plane is, Everything is sorted, it's perfect. But all of a sudden, young Stan has to travel <laughs> on his own. No word of English. I got lost in Brussels. Um, I landed in Glasgow. Come out. The guy who's supposed to wait for me he was late. And what I faced, my first step going out from the, from the airport was all the media. Everybody's waiting for me. The mics were on, on my face. And the Scots, okay. let's not forget, have a very um, feisty tabloid media like in England. It's kind of the sun, the mirror. They're, Scotland still has this, I mean, it's, it's the same with the Scottish national team. We've seen them getting beat by Russia recently in Belgium. Is that the Scottish media still talks because the Scottish national team is the equal oldest in the, in the world with the English FA. Is that they still talk about the Scottish national team as if it's a... A, 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 a big thing. So it's a very, very feisty and febrile media environment in Scotland. It's, um, you know, the media are proud to show that Celtic or Rangers are signing somebody. They've got a signing excitement. And don't forget, at that time, they had the two big names as a manager and a coach, mm. which is Kenny Deglish and John Barnes. I'll come to that they in were, a second. They were talking about, you know, how, how good the Celtic will be. They would, they would challenge Rangers again. They had Mark Viduka, El Berkovic, Lebo Moravchik, great players. Yeah. And all of a sudden, a young boy coming in. So most of, the, most of the media didn't know anything about me. They've seen me playing against England. They've seen a couple, couple games. You know, at that time, the social media wasn't mm-hmm. that big. You can't find really much about somebody. So they wanted to know about me. But unfortunately, I couldn't say a word. I couldn't say anything. I was just standing there, lost, panicking, Did sweating. the give you a tra- translator? Uh, no. <laughs> so you were literally no. thrown in the deep end yes. in, in also one of the most difficult places to learn English, probably in the British Isles, because I love Glasgow and I love Glaswegians, but you only have to listen to a Kenny Dalgleish interview or a Sir Alex Ferguson interview to know it's a very, very difficult way of learning English. It was very, it was very strange, Ron, because at that time, so it was, as, a, as a foreigner, most of, the, most of the guys were speaking good English. 
they, they were quite experienced, they were international players. So they, they could settle and live their life without, without even having problems. Mm. But I was just 19. I was there, no word of English. And this is, was the biggest problem for me. Not the, the challenge that I was facing ahead, it was the language, that barrier that I couldn't communicate which made it really, really difficult for me. The Last Word with Stan Collymore. Fantastic interview with Stylian Petrov. Don't forget the uh, bonus drop on Friday will be the full uh, HD. Me in HD. What more do you want, people, <laughs> than Stan Collymore in HD? Looking absolutely knackered first thing in the morning somewhere <laughs> around the country. Um, but they've gone down very, very well, uh, I have to say. 30, 40 minute long form interviews. You can see the questions. You can see the respondents' awkwardness or their happiness and I have to say uh, most of them so far have been incredibly candid so thanks to uh, Stylian Petrov for a fantastic interview full bonus uh, 40 minutes on Friday Paddy let's go into the Sunday games if we may because this mm. possibly qualifies as the first Super Sunday of the season mm, yeah. um, we've talked about Chelsea Liverpool and, yeah. the, and the impact that may have uh, yeah. but Manchester United Arsenal, uh, Wolves in Europe, of course, um, Newbies, Aston Villa, Roy Hodgson's Crystal Palace, West Ham, potentially the best of the rest. Plenty to talk about. So let's yeah. start at Selhurst Park, if we may. Crystal Palace won, Wolverhampton Wanderers uh, won. Mm. Um, Wolves lost only one of the last 11 visits to the capital, yep. um, but it's the sixth time Wolves haven't won their first uh, top six games. Yep. Every time that's happened, in those other five times, they've been relegated. Yes. Um Palace unbeaten in the last five at Sellers Park. Mm. Still no win for Wolves. Let's go to this. Is it a myth? Is it a cliche? Is it truth? And I could maybe shed a little bit of light on it. Europe, Euro hangover. Yes. We all know that teams like Manchester United, Liverpool, Arsenal and Chelsea that have dropped down into the secondary European competition have the squad to be able to balance yes. League, FA Cup, League Cup and Europa League. Yes. We also know that teams that have been in... Um, that have done very well to win a League Cup or a high league place in. You're thinking Burnley, uh, Birmingham City, Stoke City, Swansea City have struggled mm -hmm. and it's had an impact on their next season. Mm -hmm. I genuinely thought Wolves have Jay Moutinho, a winner. Rui Patricio, a winner. Ruben mm -hmm. Neves, a winner. Mexico's number nine that scores goals. Mm -hmm. Yotta, um, Adama Triore that's been around the block a little bit now their club record signing at the time. But Outrageous coming pace. In, coming on to a game. Um, yes. Yeah. Is that I thought Wolves had the squad to be able to compete with both. And my mates now that are all Wolves season ticket holders are yeah. worried that they're going to be relegated. Do you see enough quality in this Wolves side yes. to be able to balance Europa League and be Premier League best of the rest? Or do they need to throw their chips firmly down on one side of the table? Mm. I, do, I don't think it's a cliche that, that the Europa League, as opposed to the Champions League, affects your performance. One, because of the point you make that the clubs that get into the Europa League usually get into it because they are a mid-range club that's done very, very well, as in Fulham, Newcastle. Or dropouts from the Champions or League drop have massive squads. Or drop out, exactly. But they can handle it, as you rightly say. And, and nobody, will, you know, nobody thinks it's, it's odd if um, Arsenal, for example, field a load of kids in, in, in a Europa League And match. still get to a final and, or and, Chelsea and go and, and win get, it. And then have the problem, do we have to um, drop the kids who've got us there because their kids are so good. Um but so it, it is very, very difficult for Wolves. You're quite right. They are the nearest thing to being equipped as a top club because of partly because of their unique ownership model, but that, that's enabled them to sign the class of players that you've just listed. But there is something, and, and I don't know. I, I, I know that it's true, but I don't know why it is. Maybe you, you know, because you played might have a clue. Well, I have. I why mean, basically... Is th why is Thursday, Sunday more difficult for players I'll, I'll, than Wednesday, Saturday? I'll tell you why. Because, firstly, the Champions League is the premium tournament. Mm -hmm. You're playing against Messi. Mm -hmm. You're playing against Ronaldo. Yeah. You're playing against Mo Salah. Yeah. So the focus and the spotlight is big. It drags you up. You feel great. It's the anthem. Everything is built around this has been a premium product. And the clubs you visit tend to be easier trips. Absolutely. Than big European yeah. cities, yeah. you know, I mean, Paris. Madrid, two hours. Correct. Paris, Munich. one hour. Whereas I remember 
with Liverpool, and this was the Cup Winners' Cup, but I also had it in. I played uh, European football for Leicester City, for Aston Villa, for Liverpool, and I helped uh, Forrest get into Europe. So, so plenty of European experience. Is that you are playing naturally in a second tier tournament, so it feels like second best. Yeah, that is more difficult to get yourself up for, with the greatest respect to playing against Molde or FC Copenhagen yeah. or Athletic Bilbao than it is Real Madrid or Barcelona. And also, you hit upon something there, which is very important. I remember playing for Liverpool and we played Spartak Vladi Kafkas mm-hmm. in the Cup Winners' Cup. This was Chechnya. Mm-hmm. We got shepherded in by two helicopter gunships <laughs> at, because the, it, the tensions were still on in the late 90s. The bed that I had Mm -hmm. was five foot two and I'm six foot four. Um, There were no frills. Mm -hmm. So we play and we're having to cut, we go forward four or five hour time difference and back. Mm -hmm. And then you get in back at two, three, four in the morning. Often clubs now fly back. You then don't really do much training on the Friday. It's just just a little five aside. So your preparation has been completely thrown to cock and then also you're the last on the billing on the Sunday yes so all of those things make a difference yes. I guess the question is though Paddy did you expect Jean Martinho eminently experienced Portuguese player Rui Patricio eminently experienced Conor Cody and Bolly fantastic mm. partnership at the back for yes. Wolves did you expect them to fare better at the beginning of the season than they have in, in both the Premier League and the Europa League. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and, and again... Lost against Braga at Molyneux last week. Yeah, yeah. I, I get it. Exactly. That would be... I mean, Bra- you, you, you're not talking about mugs with Braga. So, but but even so, that you would have expected Wolves not to lose that one. Um, so, yes, you wonder whether as players, and, and, and players are insecure and... and, and, and neurotic the same way as the rest of us and they look at that long season and they and it kind of eats away at them their mind uh, I, wanna, I do want to nail you down to this should they go should they continue on the path of trying to be successful in both I mean that's a, that, that should be a given but the reality is is that they might have pick, to pick two teams two teams definitely okay and do you think they'll struggle this but season it's so difficult you've got to be brave because if you win the champ- the Europa League... You're in the Champions League. Suddenly you've made the leap and you're a Champions and League Wolves, team. And Wolves, of course, have the money but to be able Wolves, to buy Champions Wolves, League players. And they do, exactly. So it's a very... You've got to be brave. But I would say be brave, pick two teams, have two campaigns. West Ham United against Manchester United. I think all, all of a sudden of watching the coverage of Roy Keane bristling, disgusted, outraged... Uh, that a Manchester United dressing room didn't have the qualities and the standards of leadership that, of mm. course, he had. Uh, West <laughs> yes. Ham 2-0. They won the game uh, last season and could have, to be fair, uh, got something at Old Trafford last season, Manuel Pellegrini's yep. uh, men. Uh, Manuel Pellegrini's got a good record uh, recently anyway against Manchester United. He's won against Mourinho. He's won against uh, Van Gaal and Moyes, of course, in his previous incarnation as Manchester City manager. Um where are we at with this great football club? Because mm. my feeling is four years ago, Liverpool were thrown in the bin by most fans and pundits as they can't get back for a, a, a generation. Mm-hmm. Several players changed that very, very quickly, particularly the likes of Salah, Mane uh, and Virgil van Dijk, and you could probably throw in the goalkeeper. Plus a very good recruitment policy that drags Andy uh, Robertson from nowhere. Well, Hull actually. And Trent Alexander-Arnold, young kid coming through from the academy. A perfect balance. Yes. Manchester United have spent on young players like Daniel James and the future of their central defensive block in terms of Harry Maguire. But I looked around the team yesterday, Paddy, and, mm-hmm. and I will ask you this quite mm-hmm. to be quite blatant, mm-hmm. brutal about this. Yeah. Manchester United's defenders, mm. Lindelof, mm. decent. decent. Harry Maguire, very good. Uh, Ashley Young, mm. De- f- um, do you want to be relying on him at his age in uh, the back four? 15 years ago, I'd have, I'd have thought he'd got a chance of being a Man United player. Yeah, yeah 15 yeah. years ago. Aaron Wan-Bissaka, future. But it's this midfield for mm. me, and I'm thinking, when you look at, let's do the direct comparison. I've got on my screen here. Manchester City's midfield. This is for all, visualize it, <laughs> our listeners. So Manchester City's um, midfielders. You could throw in whether it doesn't matter whether they're attacking midfielders or or generic midfielders or City midfielders. Rodrigo, new player that's come in. 
Um, Kevin De Bruyne, we've already extolled the virtues, could well be heading towards Player of the Year. Yes. David Silva, a decade of just of sterling service. One of the best players to Bernardo, play in the Premier League. Bernardo cool Silva, hat trick. Yes. And yes. Riyad Mahrez, that essentially is the is is the a go to guy off the bench that was a Premier League miracle man with Leicester City. Right. So just think about those names for me for a second. Yeah. And, uh, and and drink them in, as Martin Tyler would say. <laughs> now, Manchester United's midfield, Juan Mata, yeah. nice guy. Yeah. Got rid of, Mourinho got rid of him at Chelsea, took him on at Man United. Good, steady Eddie. Mm. Andreas Pereira, one for the future. Daniel James, one for the future. Mm. Nemanja Matic, hamstrung literally with injuries over the yeah. last two or three years. One for the past. And Scott McTominay, a steady, yeah, a, a steady Eddie. How far off Manchester United are they off Liverpool and Manchester City? Mm. But more relevantly, how far ahead of Wolves, Leicester? I mean, I would swap that Manchester United midfield. For, uh, if, if I was Brendan Rodgers and you said uh, you've, got you mid, you've, got, you you've got your midfield, Brendan, of Chowdhury, of Perez, of, of Madison. Chowdhury we could doesn't have made, even start something. So w- where did Manchester United start in terms of this growth process? Do they do it with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer and get to the end of the season and say, we're now going to have to really go for a potch? Mm. Or do they stick with Ole Gunnar Solskjaer for the long term and potentially Mm. have one season in the Champions League, two seasons in the Europa League? Mm. I dare suggest that that's not good enough for Manchester United Football Club. Yeah, it is. I mean, Solskjaer's already laid the ground by saying this is a long-term thing. Uh, You know, it, it... we're going to have bad days, we're going to have good days, but we're buying young players, look at, at what we're doing, we're producing. Mason Greenwood's going to be a, a wonderful player, well, already is a wonderful player, and he's 17. So we're producing youngsters like Manchester United always have to. Um, so he's trying to prime people for a long but you, you, you're you got to be competitive now, Paddy. Yeah, exactly. You're postulating your theory on the fact that that's all very well, Ole, but you'll get months, you won't get years. So I, I agree with you, but I, the, the problem that Manchester United, and you were quite right, Man City have got reserves that would be the, the top player at Manchester United, Fernandinho, who's, who's filling in at centre-half. I mean, what would Manchester United do for a player of his quality? So uh, Raheem Sterling didn't even... Play, you know. I mean, uh, I mean, th- these would be Man United would have to play a world record fee to get Ryan. Well, this is the question, if- Paddy. I mean, in 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 the next eight months or so of the season, mm. is this going to be just a very torturous next two or three years for Manchester United? Or looking at the yeah. Liverpool example well, that I be. gave four or five years ago, weren't necessarily competitive. Now are competitive. Is come this but turn Stan, round for Manchester United? The key United in very your quickly. analysis earlier was recruitment. I mean, okay, if Manchester United had Jurgen Klopp, we wouldn't be talking about a crisis club because he's one of the greatest managers of our of your lifetime or even mine. Ole Gunnar Solskjaer has managed at Cardiff City and Molde. And Molde, yes. I mean, he's, he's Man United through and through and, and, and that'll count for a lot. But come on, Klopp is a great man. On the web, I mean, you, hate, you hesitate to use that word when a guy's only been in the country four or five years, but he is a great manager. So you're alluding and to the fact that Manchester United may have to have managerial not, change it's, it's with, not uh, just, alongside... But it's not just the recruitment of manager. I mean, Manchester United fans are entitled to say, Liverpool got Jurgen Klopp. Where's uh, Man City have got Pep Guardiola? Where's our... Now, you might say, well, I got you Mourinho... Unfortunately, you got Mourinho once he was on the turn. But uh, the recruitment at Manchester United, their marquee players have all been, by Man United standards, rubbish. Pogba, for goodness sake. Alexis. 89 million. Yet Fred, 60 million nearly. Fred, they couldn't even get in that dreadful team yesterday. Um, Lukaku, he's, okay, he's gone now. But he was a bad signing for that for the money they paid for him. A terrible signing. He must have put. And you're going back, of course, to the likes of how many kilos did he put on at Manchester United? Well, he would argue none, but he's just said he's doing the weights. But you're also going back to players like how much um, how much unnecessary bulk did he put on then? Okay, I don't have a weighing uh, machine, but I know what a a player who's too bulky looks like, and so do you. You you admit that. So 
You've got to. I'm smiling. <laughs> yeah. yeah. With 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 the diplo- the sense of diplomacy for which Stanley Collins. Right. I'm going. I need to nail, nail you down. Okay. You you Ed just Woodward. Just for time. You're Ed Woodward. Yes. Do the signings have to be uh, the, the the young hungry signings mm. have to be balanced with two or three marquee that players what, that have to work? That was, that was what I was saying. And yes. also, does that com- come in a package with a new manager at the end of the season? In your opinion, a yes or a no from you? Yes. West Ham United, please. I want you to uh, to turn your thoughts to them. Um, Manuel Pellegrini, uh, this silent man, the Smith song, and uh, they had a banner when he was there. Got his head down, very steady Eddie. There's no sort of, if you think of a heart monitor, when, you know, it goes up and down, your heart's racing, it's nice and even. Mm. Um, the right man at the right time for West Ham United uh, to push them on incrementally rather than pretend you're London's biggest club because you've moved into the Olympic Stadium. Quite absolutely spot on, Stan. I, I When Pellegrini was appointed, I must confess that I was sort of underwhelmed from the West Ham point of view. 60,000 capacity stadium, you know, we're up there with Arsenal and, and, and Chelsea now. You know, we, we want to be competing. We want to be scrapping with them. I thought, well, did he just ride the Manchester City horse, you know, uh, without falling off, basically? And, uh, well, but, uh, I was wrong. Stability, he's been, he's consistency. Been perfect, perfect choice. And he's a, a very good recruitment. We, we talked about recruitment. Look at the rec- Yarmolenko. Would you have thought he would fit in to English football like a hand in a glove the way he has done? Uh, Declan Rice, you know, come, come, came through Sebastian the Sebastian Allaire up front. Uh, no, I mean, what, what, I think a key one for me is, is that Aaron Creswell had been uh, widely derided as his performance levels over the last couple of seasons. Remember he had that great season, he was scoring it, it goals was, two, three years wonderful. ago. He was the chill well of the yes. time, yeah. And his performances had dropped off around yep. the time of a, of a new contract, allegedly, and also uh, it, one or two injuries. Yes. Uh, Makawaka, that's been great down the left-hand yep. side, gets uh, is out for the game. Creswell comes in, scores a free kick. There are now competition for places and pay, players are grabbing it. Yeah. That would that would be the sign of a very, very healthy ecosystem at West Ham. You're Time. talking about healthiness. You haven't, we didn't even mention Lanzini, you know. And I mean, the, the, Arnautovic seemed to divide opinion. There don't seem to be players dividing. It looks like a team, doesn't it, Stan? I mean, it, it looks like a team that believes in the way it plays, believes it can mix it up a, a bit. You know, you've got your rice to protect the defence. You've got Lanzini to... Um, and you've got Felipe a... Anderson. Felipe Anderson. The midfield exactly. of West Ham were Yarmolenko, the Ukrainian Felipe Anderson. It came off after 70 minutes. Mark yes. Noble. Yes. Bit of English, bit of well, East End. Yeah, got a bit of uh, exactly. Pablo Fornals, the Spaniard, and Declan Rice against, again, a very nice balanced a, uh, midfield that perhaps balance. Manchester is better than Manchester United's, uh, prove, as proven by yesterday. Well, exactly. Uh, can, uh, very, very briefly, because I want to go to the stats and then I want to ask, uh, we, we want to finish off the, uh, the show mm. with. Mm. Um, uh, news from non-Premier League related yep. stuff. Yeah. Um, can West Ham exploit Wolves' European hangover? Can they exploit Everton's inconsistency? Yeah. Can they exploit Watford's struggles and be in that group of best amongst the rest? Yes, I definitely think so. We touched on that in the context of Bournemouth earlier, but West Ham are at the other end of the potential scale now that they've got this stadium deal. Um so, yes, I would say yes, 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 yes to those four questions. Paddy, thank you very much for, uh, for joining me with the, uh, the review uh, of the weekend's games. It's now the stats with Stan. Now on The Last Word with Stan Collymore, Stan stats. OK, Paddy, my uh, weekly stats with Stan. I like a stat. I need to just allude to what may... Uh, mm-hmm. be coming for your team or club out there uh, in terms of have you scored enough goals or are you creating enough chances and what you see over a season is the usual suspects uh, do crop up on some of these lists um, so let's start with the most goals scored no surprise there Manchester City with eight they will top that uh, list I would imagine along with Liverpool they will yo-yo between them during the season most shots in a game Manchester City with 28 least shots in a game Sheffield United uh, two but they scored with both of them, so it didn't matter (laughs) against uh, Everton at Goodison. Most shots on target, Manchester City with 11. Uh, Just to give our uh, um, audience an idea, 6-7 is quite good. I mean, Villa, for example, had nine shots on target at uh, at Arsenal, which Mm. is exceptional Mm. on a away day Mm. and against the top six. So the data analysts will be looking at that and saying, happy days, we just need to convert them. Mm. Uh, Least shots on target, Sheffield United. 
um, with those two that I mentioned. Most completed passes, Manchester City, That's almost another. twice than the vast yep. majority of Premier League teams, 656. And most tackles in a game, uh, it was Wolves down at Sellers not Park. A bad, not a bad stat. Though. It's not a bad stat. But again, a lot of people say Manchester City don't tackle Stan, Liverpool don't tackle, they just hassle and hurry and win the ball back. Yeah. You'll often this season see Manchester City in the top two or three teams uh, that will tackle. So those are your stats with Stan. The Last Word. You're listening to The Last Word podcast with Stan Collingwood. Don't forget all of the uh, 40, 45 minute uh, full HD interviews are on YouTube. Uh, We have a bonus drop on Friday, which is usually the audio version of some cracking interviews that we've had. And uh, the Monday show is very much uh, myself and a guest presenter. Paddy Barkley is going to join me uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, Emil Heskey, of course. We've had Hugh Wizzy, Sam Miller. Uh, We've changed it up quite a lot. Great to have uh, lots of different voices on the show on a Monday, looking back at the Premier League uh, action and, of course, a 10-15 minute teaser interview uh, for our big guest. So let's have a look at the news, uh, Paddy. Mm. Um, Two, three, four, five, we'll pick a couple from the football week. So Mm. I've got uh, non-Premier League, if possible, because we spend most of our time talking about the Premier League. So I want to be brief on these stories. La Liga. Uh, Luis Suarez comments, Paddy. Mm. uh, Barca have a tough year ahead. Um, They haven't started the season very well. Lionel Messi, of course, will go through the season and score his 20, 30, 40 goals. Mm. But is this going to be an eventual changing of the guard, uh, a changing of seasons from this team that have, yeah. not if not dominated, been at the centre of, of the football world in the way football is coached, yes. the way it's played, to something different now? Is it just a natural change for Barcelona? Well, that- they've become, uh, apart from Lionel Messi, obviously, uh, they have become just another team. And I, I think we... The danger, sig- the danger signs were uh, at, at the end, towards the end of last season, when they threw away a three-nil lead to Liverpool. Now, okay, people will say, well, Liverpool had something to do with that, and and they did. Trent uh, uh, once again scoring the greatest ever set-piece goal I've ever seen, or uh, making it. But that was when they should have said, hey, this doesn't happen to us. We overturn deficits. We don't get overturned. We don't get turned over. So, so do you think that may well have had a huge mental impact? I mean, yes. I know it did at the time, because I, I remember Lionel Messi having to come out and almost talk to the... Yeah. I mean, because obviously Barcelona is the capital of the Catalonia region. It's yeah. almost a sort of semi-national team. Yeah. Is they almost had to apologise. Well, uh, Ernesto Valverde was a sort of busted flush from that moment, really. Now, you might say, well, like, you know, it would have helped if uh, Gerard Piquet hadn't turned his back on a corner, along with all his mates. And, and, and had a chat and a fag while, you know, a, free, a great set piece was being taken. But... You know, it it was there. Definitely was something wrong. We've seen it also with the flirtation, um, um, the flirtation with bringing um, uh, B- 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 Neymar back. Yes. Now, just about every other member of the squad, apart from Messi, has been mentioned as a possible swap to Paris Saint Germain. How, how good must that make them feel? And so, what you're finding is the, the particularly vulnerable away from home. I, I mean, there've been a few. Lucky clubs that have had Anfield moments mm. when Barcelona have visited, and that's not good enough. But you know, I think if you're a football fan, there's a little bit of you that keeps an eye on Barcelona. Really, we need a health. We've been spoiled. We had the team of Rijkaard yes. with uh, Ronaldinho, we then uh, and little Messi then coming, Pep's team. come through. Then Pep's teams, which were you could say, even better. It's, it's arguably very good for the La Liga, though, that if it's they are on the way, because Real Madrid haven't quite yet got back to where they feel that they should be in terms of challenging for titles. No, you, and you're you starting to see Sevilla, Valencia, Real Betis, Third all of those force, clubs. Yeah. For, their, for their league, I'm talking about their brand now, the Premier League is omnipresent because of the perception at the very yes, least as a top true. six or seven or clubs like Wolves is that that's not the case in Barcelona. I just want to, yeah. want to move things uh, yeah, sure. forward. Yeah. Aaron Ramsey scored uh, for Juve against Verona at the weekend. And um, we've had many players that have gone abroad, going all the way back to John Charles and Jimmy Greaves. Mm. And then you're thinking about McManaman and Michael Owen and David Beckham to La Liga. Um, But this one's been sort of unheralded, really. A very good pro, came to the end of his contract at Arsenal. Um, 
could well be ending the season with a, a Serie A title. Mm. And uh, he's starting to uh, to add goals to the uh, the grand old lady of Italian football. Yeah. It's nice to see uh, well, somebody take the, no, I, the, the leap and go and that, test themselves. That's the phrase. I mean, he's one of those footballers that you kind of wish well. A captain of Wales at 18. You, you, you realise, uh, maybe Gary Speed, so I can't remember who it was, who the late uh, Gary Speed. Um, somebody saw real leadership in, in this boy when he was still playing for, I think, Cardiff. Now, another uh, thing was when he went over to, to Juventus, I, I watched an interview, I think it was on Twitter. Um, somebody had said, just look at this. And in his interview, he spoke... Italian. He spoke patches of Italian and made it very, very clear that he was going to be speaking... Imbue himself in the culture. Exactly. And that was a good sign. And I, so I, I think it'd be I think it'd be great if he if he does get a medal. Lots of the uh, the tabloids and the broadsheets going with a similar line today. And I know I was asked about Ole mm. Gunnar with Manchester United losing. Cause it's yeah. such a, uh, for my mirror column today, because it's such yes. a big story. Yes, it is. Thomas Tuchel uh, of, of Paris Saint-Germain, of course... Mm. Um, Routinely lined up over the last two or three weeks as uh, as the potential man if Ole Gunnar Solskjaer isn't given time at Manchester United. Yeah. Um, the, this one name keeps cropping up, so you suggest it's coming from somewhere. Well, he's sort of Klopp light, isn't he? I mean, I, and I suppose that's what people are looking for. Uh, it's Klopp light. That, that's, that sounds a bit sort of damning with faint praise. It's not meant to. Very different going a, from Paris Saint Germain, where you've won. 21 of the last 24 trophies available in France to mm-hmm. Manchester United that are in a huge re- rebuilding job. Yes, but you, I suppose you could argue he's used to being at a, at a big club. And of course, he got very good experience in Germany before that. So um, but it's, a, it's, a good, it's, it's a good shout. I, I mean, I suppose most people would, would think it's a bit early to be writing Ole Gunnar Solskjaer off. But as you say, it's, it's not going to go away, this one. And finally, Bernardo Silva. I didn't know how to take this. I've, I've got to say um, to our audience, this year I've taken a very different view to uh, the way that I tweet. Is that I tweet about the show and I'm, I'm trying to be incredibly positive because I was chatting to Gary Lineker last week, reminded me of why at the beginning of the season... I got rid of, I stopped following a lot of uh, political accounts. Yes. We're in a real mess with Brexit, whatever side of the debate you fall on. Yes. And it's like, I've, I've, I'm done with it. I'm sick of being wound up by this politician, that politician, this politician, mm-hmm. and also other accounts of people that just wound me up. Mm-hmm. It wasn't good. You sit up at night and you're having arguments with people. And it's like, I'm, I'm too old for this. Mm. So I, I, I now take, and, you know, it's kind of like, I take that step back and I go, do I want to get involved in this debate or not? And 99% out of 100, it's no. And that's good for my mental health. It's yes. good for my, the way that I tweet. It's more engaging with people that want to engage with you on a, yes. on a football level. Yes. But I saw this tweet and it wound me up. And it was Bernardo Silva's tweet to his teammate. Of course, Bernardo Silva's Portuguese. Mm-hmm. Benjamin Mendy's French. Mm-hmm. And it was essentially the equivalent of a Portuguese gollywog. Mm. A uh, sort of big black c- cartoon character figure with a big red lips, mm. um, which I remember as a kid because I always used to be told, you know, get yourself back on the top of the jam jar uh, as as a, as a racial slight. Mm. So he sends this message to Bert Benjamin Mendy and then deletes it because a lot of people are reminding him that you know in, 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 we have slightly different ways of viewing these things in England than we do in Portugal or in France. Mm-hmm. He then yesterday or it was late last night said. Oh, guys, having a bit of fun. You guys have been super serious. I guess the question is, Paddy, for me as a, a mixed ethnicity British yeah. male, I can yeah. look at things and say, well, we don't do that here. Yeah. But I'm fascinated from a journalistic perspective and also um, from your perspective of, of looking at things like this. Are, are, is it too easy to just say we're being too harsh here and being ridiculously politically correct. These guys uh, have slightly different ways of doing things mm. in Portugal and Spain and Italy. Mm. Or is this one of those where he needs to be politely reminded that he is playing his trade in England, as is Benjamin Mendy. One's Portuguese, one's French. We just don't do this. Yeah. My understanding was that it wasn't meant... You see, I don't really know if dressing room banter, you're allowed to go further or be more risky Risque. I think in the four walls of the dressing room, even now, it's because, a very unpolitically correct place. Because let's face it, if Benjamin N- Mendy wanted to give him a right hand or two as a form of education... Should somebody say to Bernardo Silva, instead of tweeting, um, come on guys, have a sense of humour, mm. should people be at Manchester City saying to him, 
you're in England now. I think the problem is that it now comes in fr- that if it comes in front of us, then I think it is inevitable that he has to be just reminded that although you're in our dressing room and how you behave there is up to you and the other players, we cannot have this being put in front of the public in in British society. So it's a it's a it's a polite reminder. It's yes. not throwing the kid under the bus because no. he comes from a culture that that no. where it's, it's it's a different way of talking about. Uh, ethnic minorities, yeah, and it's you a see, polite reminder, and he learns and moves you on. Don't, I'm not. I wouldn't. Yes, exactly. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Uh, uh, you know what you said about, about being Portuguese. When I was a, a kid, I, as well as admiring Brazilian football, I used to think it would be lovely to live in a society like that, where it seemed to me that the majority of people were of mixed race. Mm. You know, it was very much a, a shades of. Of course, one of the first first great colonial nations yes. founded Brazil. Yeah. Brazil is uh, incredibly mixed uh, yeah. in founded terms of ethnicity. The and there, um, you know, the way people of different pigmentations, yeah, their nicknames would often re- refer to the pigmentation, but it wouldn't be it wouldn't stop them being best mates. Um, it was just a way, you know, people might call me baldy. You know, it, it was like that. Yes. But that said, this is not the case in our country. And he is in our country. If he's going to take the money, he has to buy into the culture. Paddy, thank you very much, as always, for your uh, insight. Did you enjoy it again? I loved it. I hope um, I can come back. You can come back whenever you like. Uh, that's your lot for this week. A huge thank you to Paddy Barkley for joining me today. Don't forget to stick your notifications on for your podcast provider to get the very latest content and big interviews. See you next week. The Last Word with Stan Collimore. Thanks again to CT1, voted the number one sealant and adhesive in the UK for supporting the number one sports podcast. Reducing carbon footprint on building sites is now a mission statement by large construction companies. And by using CT1, you don't have to use seven products, just one tube suffices. So if you use CT1, one product replaces seven. So if you use 700 tubes on site, that goes down to just 100 if you use CT1. CT1, better for the environment and the UK's number one sealant and adhesive. This is a Listening Dog Media production. (laughs) 